So what we have here is a PowerPoint, which uh, right now on the website, there's a link to an HTML version, um, which is uh, somewhat useful, useful because it could be uh, searchable. Uh, the text on, on that could be searchable. It's all you know, a bunch of different web pages. But um, I'll get the PowerPoint uh, posted there too. Or, or maybe I'll try to make Graham happy and I'll, I'll post a, uh, uh, a keynote version. Okay. Uh, it'll be the same, you know, with this presentation, it'll all be the same difference. So what we're doing here is uh, we're applying what we've learned about um, imaging uh, and reflection imaging, you know, in terms of the uh, Wuanaki uh, uh, asymptotic media approximations for the uh, for very simple reflection coefficients, in terms of using rays and the same old imaging conditions and downward continuation for the um, uh, for carrying you know amplitudes reflection amplitudes from the source to the to the reflector back to the receiver, uh, using the Born approximation to uh, select the primary reflection data, okay, uh, and a uh, uh, the tomographic approximation to use the transpose, the adjoint of the forward process, as an appro a first approximation to the inverse process. So we're going from data to a uh, a model. And um, I mentioned uh, how this is uh, very sensitive. Um, if you're really trying to, to distinguish between, say, delta rho, delta lambda, and delta mu in the elastic world, um, cases of, of uh, reflectors, you really have to get wider angles. You've got to get wider theta. Um, uh, because these are most, you know, the signals from these different reflectors, uh, you know, call them canonical reflectors, they're most different at 90 degrees, okay? Uh, certainly, uh, they're also different at, uh, at uh, 180 degrees, okay? So forward scattering even can be, can be useful <clears throat> in distinguishing these. And the problem with Ronan Labrasse's elastic result in his in his uh, thesis, which I, I'm not sure ever got published, you know, he carried on and and developed, uh, uh, you know, similar modules uh, commercially. Um, so he got he was able to get his uh, his work out there very effectively. Um, but uh, you know, the little example in his thesis, I think, um, you know, failed to fully capitalize on even on that particular data set because he was forced to get rid of the direct wave by um, removing all of the forward scattering. And, and in fact, um, by keeping only the back scattering, um, he had to, uh, he, he was forced to select uh, uh, the, you know, and keeping only the, filtering out uh, all of the downgoing waves uh, from those VSP records, he had to keep only the back scattering. And the result of that, was uh, that his uh, his thetas you know were basically restricted to zero to forty five degrees, and so you know the the elastic example there was not as effective as it could be, uh, you know it was working but um, but uh, you know the impedance image was really what was the uh, what was working the best. So uh, I went then to uh, you know this is many years after. Um, after Ronan's developments, um, I went to uh, look at uh, earthquake records, and uh, you know, subduction zone earthquakes get generated at what's called the slab interface. This is where the uh, the sediments and water, um, the sea bottom has been shoved underneath the continent. Okay. And uh, one of the world's uh, smaller continents um, is uh, Zealandia, um, which is the term the, the Kiwis uh, use for their continent, which, of course, nobody else recognizes. But uh, Zealandia is actually quite a good-sized continent. It's, it's probably bigger than the, 
the Madagascar uh, continental mass, which is something uh, we heard about uh, last week uh, in the grad seminar. Um, and uh, you know these these are old uh, shield rocks, and uh, New Zealand has lots, Zealandia has lots of them, and uh, Madagascar has lots of them, uh, but they're on uh, you know they're on an island, so it's really a continental fragment. But uh, the thing about uh, Zealandia is that it's about ninety percent underwater, uh, and there's uh, you know right now an enormous amount of um, of oil exploration going on because. Uh, you know there are continental basins uh, uh, that have been inundated, but now uh, can be surveyed with the marine uh, uh, marine geophysics, and so there there's this enormous uh, continental shelf area of offshore New Zealand that is just starting to be explored, um, and you can you know from certain areas uh, you can dredge up um, you know granites and gneisses and uh, the uh, you know old uh, subduction complexes, um, you know continental volcanics, all those things are are throughout the continent of uh, of Zealandia. So um, there is a place uh, on the east side of the North Island where the um, uh, right. I do have to credit my uh, New Zealand colleagues for getting me involved in this uh, from uh, GNS science mostly. Uh, who, by the way, has the most awesome um, native name uh, that you have ever heard of, Tepu Ao, which means Wizards of the Universe. It's an awesome um, name. If you have to choose a name in some native language, they, they did it right. Um, OK, <clears throat> so we have the, uh, at the Hikarangi Trough, we have the, um, uh, the Pacific Plate, which in this area, has a 15-kilometer uh, basaltic uh, plateau on top of it, um, and that's why uh, the depth is not too great there. Um, that uh, uh, that you know five you know typical five-kilometer oceanic crust, topped with the non-typical 15-kilometer uh, uh, basaltic uh, oceanic plateau, is being shoved underneath the continental rocks of the New Zealand North Island. Which is uh, mostly old uh, subduction complexes, and there is um, back arc uh, spreading, uh, a very uh, basin and range uh, kind of um, uh, extensional province called the uh, um, the TVZ. They say down there, um, Taupo uh, Volcanic Zone. Uh, there are some uh, whoops volcanoes located. Um, and they, uh, they, of course, generally follow the axis where the, uh, um, where the downgoing slab gets to be about 100 uh, kilometers deep. And we're looking uh, at uh, this area where there were, uh, there were some earthquakes in 1980. Um, no, 1990, I'm sorry. Um, two magnitude 6 earthquakes, and, the, and, the, uh, and each with their subsequent uh, aftershocks. They were about four months apart. Um, and uh, the slab interface, it's a very shallowly dipping uh, uh, slab, and the slab interface under the Weber events is at about 20 kilometers depth. Um, very similar, Wellington's down here, so very similar to uh, uh, the depth under, under Wellington, maybe 35 kilometers under Wellington. It's uh, it, it, at the northern part of the, uh, northeastern part of the North Island, it's uh, you know, almost uh, normal subduction, and then you get down towards Wellington. It's very much oblique uh, subduction. Also mentioned that uh, Christchurch is here, and this is an old fault map uh, without the uh, the faults that uh, afflicted Christchurch a few years ago. Um, so basically, uh, uh, New Zealand is is really much like Nevada. There are actually faults everywhere, and the seismic hazard is 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 nowhere low. Uh, they, the Kiwis like to think that Auckland, which has a quarter of their population of four and a half million, uh, that Auckland is safe from earthquakes, but uh, I, I beg to differ, and a few of my colleagues in New Zealand agree. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, lots of volcanics up there, too. So they're just trying to work out the volcanic hazard. I think there's earthquake hazard as well. So my colleagues uh, uh, 
Donna Everhart Phillips, we've got to get her up here for a, uh, a seminar uh, sometime. Uh, she's uh, moved from uh, Otago University and GNS uh, back to uh, UC Davis. So uh, uh, she has a huge uh, um, background and uh, uh, much previous work, you know, basically getting tomographic velocity models up and down Zealandia and many other places. So uh, uh, her work with Martin Rainers uh, shows uh, under the uh, um, uh, shows a you know throughout the uh, the Hikarangi subduction zone um, about a one to two kilometer thick plate interface that has a high ratio of VP over VS uh, and produces STP conversions from events uh, you know that due to plate bending that are down below the plane inter interface. All right. What do you mean by well, that's where the, the, you know, when you have a subduction zone earthquake, that's the plate interface is, is where the, you know, the, the subducted seafloor meets the bottom of the accretionary wedge. And uh, so there's a lot of, you know, fluid and sediment dragged down in there. And you would think that for any crustal imaging experiment, if you can't interface, if you can't image the plate interface, you're not going to be able to image anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It's the it's you know the head wall is the uh, Australian plate and the foot wall is the Pacific plate. Yeah. And and it's a it's an age inversion too. I mean, the accre you know, unless you're underplating the accretionary wedge, which certainly happens, you know, you've got older, deeper rocks, you know, midway through the crust, that are you know interacting with re very recently subducted rocks. Uh, at the top of the downgoing plate. Okay, so the uh, the yellow dots here. Uh, this is uh, Cape Turnagain, uh, as noted by Captain Cook, and um, you can see Wellington is down here. These uh, salmon-colored inverted triangles are uh, seismic stations, and uh, with the exception of of this one. And uh, I think one uh, seismic station in this group, this is all, uh, all those stations were a temporary deployment of several months, uh, 10 station deployment uh, that recorded 500 events. And um, here are the epicenters, uh, the, the uh, sort of dim yellow, uh, yellow squares are the epicenters of those 500 events. Um, so we're going to set a, uh, uh, in the parlance of, um, uh, of my uh, AARG uh, um, uh, LATMIG uh, codes, we're going to set a max off of 70 kilometers. So we're going to ignore any traces coming from more than 70 kilometers away, which means we're going to ignore the network data from uh, these uh, more further stations. Um, and um, we're going to see what this uh, this array can tell us about uh, uh, any uh, Reflections and forward scattering from the plate interface. Okay. Um, now, why am I uh, um, a little bit more on the on the the events? You know, why why am I able to uh, get forward scattering with this? Um, and we'll look at pretty soon in a cross section. Um, but the the. There were two main shocks. Okay, the Weber One event, as it came to be known, was a magnitude six point two in February of nineteen ninety, and um, it was uh, 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 at a at a um, let's see. Uh, its depth is not extremely well constrained because there were only uh, uh, a couple of stations, uh, you know, anywhere nearby. Um, but it was definitely below the plate interface, and uh, which so that's it's more than 20 kilometers deep. So it's a it's a plate event. Uh, here's its mechanism. Uh, you know the 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 strike of the subduction zone basically is the strike of of both nodal planes, and you can see it's a normal type event in these lower hemisphere uh, uh, beach ball mechanisms. Um, 
So uh, uh, it's uh, probably uh, on this um, on this steep uh, on this steep uh, northwest dipping uh, plane, and in fact, uh, all the aftershocks, which are located very well, you know, after they put out the ten station temporary deployment, okay, the aftershocks uh, <coughs> are really following that plane, okay, that uh, uh, steeply uh, northwest dipping plane. The um, um, uh, then three months later, there was the Weber II event, okay? which notice it has uh, you know, kind of an inverse mechanism. Um, uh, now, the subduction direction here is really closer to east-west, whereas the, the strike of the subduction zone is uh, north northeast. Okay? But the subduction direction is toward the, toward the west. Um, and the, uh, so the, uh, the Weber II mechanism, it's a magnitude 6.4 event. And uh, you can see it's a thrust mechanism, kind of oblique thrust um, in this lower hemisphere. The aftershocks, which are in yellow here, uh, sorry, the Weber I aftershocks are the gray diamonds. The uh, yellow squares are the Weber II uh, aftershocks. And in fact, the main, uh, the main shock is in there too. Um, because the, the monitoring was very good when Weber II happened. Um, so the, uh, uh, the aftershocks line up along this, um, this very shallow dipping, uh, uh, very shallow northwest dipping plane. Okay? So it was a thrust event um, you know, up to the, uh, up to the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, south, you know, the east southeast. Um, Okay, now um, this uh, uh, um, let's see. Yeah, here's a Weber one aftershock. It's not the Weber one uh, main shock. It's just some data from that. Okay, the um, um, uh, we've got uh, we've got that uh, aftershock seen at. Uh, uh, the station TEU, so it comes up from deep, goes through the plate interface, kind of right in front of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the normal fault, okay, and comes up to station TEU, all right. And uh, there's a lot of this. Uh, it's got a much larger coda, you know, if you normalize it according to the uh, uh, the S wave, okay, which is this first big event. There's a lot of this uh, coda. There's, there's uh, something going on that's uh, bringing in uh, all this uh, uh, scattered energy and coming straight up through the interface. Uh, you know, I'll show you a, a section, but uh, you know, to this location, um, it's a lot of forward scattering. Okay, if it's coming from the plate interface, that's that's the the problem to prove. Okay, this same event, you know, from deep comes up again through the plate interface, but now not over here. To the west, to, to station uh, WTA, and uh, <clears throat> and you can see it's got basically the same uh, kind of uh, arrival, <clears throat> and there's a lot less uh, scattering. Okay, so there's uh, you know the forward scattering here from this Weber one aftershock, which is only uh, magnitude one point six. Okay, and it's thirty two kilometers deep, so quite deep. Uh, the forward scattering is really location dependent. And coming from a tight little spot right around here. All right, so we had uh, this this this. Uh, by the time they got the uh, temporary array out there, uh, they were still able to record about 200, you know, small Weber one uh, aftershocks, and then uh, they the array recorded the Weber two main shock and 300 upper plate aftershocks. Okay, um, Russell Robinson of GNS. Uh, uh, relocated all the hypercenters and, and developed a uh, inverted a uh, a one D velocity model. You know, with this kind of ray coverage, with a very uh, a very tight source zone, right? The source zone is all sort of within uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 by twenty kilometer area. Um, there just wasn't enough uh, ray coverage to justify a three D uh, velocity analysis. So the two D was uh, had to be good enough. Okay, so that enables me to use time migration, but not depth migration. Okay, um, 
And uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, you know in the the radiation patterns of the uh, of the aftershocks are are really at least in composite mechanisms they're they're very similar to the uh, the radiation pattern of the of the of it of the corresponding main shock. Okay. So uh, okay, here's the uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm suggesting there's a you know kind of complex interface conversion of forward scattering. Uh, the S to P conversion at the plate interface uh, was seen under you know a few hundred kilometers to the northeast uh, under the the eastern tip of the North Island, which is called the uh, the Raukumara, uh, Peninsula. Um, and, and Eberhard Phillips and Rayner saw that, uh, and then uh, just a little bit to the north, just off the map here, is a uh, place called Hawks Bay, and, and uh, my uh, colleague Steve Bannister also saw the uh, S to P conversion there. Um, there's no, um, there's no obvious, uh, you know, there were no events under here, so uh, you know the the S P to P conversions were seen where there were events. You know, recorded from under the below the plate interface, and in this area, particular area, in the Weber area, Cape Turnagain, uh, you know, there hadn't been any before the uh, the Weber events in the Weber one events in 1990. There, there uh, had really been no recorded um, uh, uh, plate events. You know, down below the plate interface. You know, plate bending events. So we don't we we haven't determined yet. Um, you know, there there may be a few, okay, but we haven't determined yet uh, uh, whether there are any data from this area with S to P or P to S conversion uh, at the plate interface. Um, so uh, you know, our data set was all more than three days after Weber one, okay. So I'm going to use this. Uh, uh, you know this this lack of information so far is part of my story. Uh, let's see if you if you buy it. Um, you know P to P conversion or uh, forward scattering. Uh, I have noticed, uh, and here's here's an example uh, from certain Weber one events to some stations. Okay, if they pass through this spot here at the plate interface on the on the map. Um, okay, so. Um, you know, here's uh, an attempt to look for the P2P scattering. We've got uh, uh, the traces uh, from a particular uh, station. This one is called AGA. Here's that station WTA again. I'm looking at the uh, vertical component of recording. And um, I'm, I've normalized each trace. Uh, uh, so, you know, I've kind of taken out the variation in. Uh, um, uh, I've, I've taken out the the uh, uh, variation in, in amplitude due to the different uh, uh, magnitudes of the earthquakes. All right, and then I've sorted them by the bright spot scatter arrival time. So um, the uh, uh, you know I went in and and uh, computed the. Um, uh, you know, if they had come through this this particular spot of the plate interface, you know, and each each one is from a each event is from a different depth and and from a uh, uh, from a different state and, and well, they're all recorded at one station for each section, okay. But there are different depths and different locations, the sources. Um, you know, I calculated what the time would be to go through that bright spot, and uh, I'll show you the bright spot in a bit. Um, and then I sorted the traces by the by that, and and here, you know, here's a, uh, uh, and you can see there's some jitter in it, but uh, um, here's the uh, P to P scattering time, and then here's the S to P scattering time, um, and uh, uh, so you can see things parallel to those lines, you know, maybe sort of lining up. Uh, you know the data set is not that great, so uh, it is hard to uh, you know hard to see what we're looking at in uh, uh, in the original data. That's one of the weaknesses of this uh, of this paper. Um, 
the uh, the forward you know P2P scattering time, which you can see, you know, in some places it's it's right behind the P arrival, okay, and uh, you can see that that's where there's some stronger relative amplitudes, and you know maybe down here, you know, we're also looking at some pretty bright uh, P2P uh, scatter. Uh, here's another another look at the. Uh, um, this is a uh, uh, a gather of 250 uh, Weber one events. Um, so uh, we're looking at a single receiver gather, and uh, you know direct waves and forward scatter would be uh, uh, dipping to the right. Okay, back scattering would be dipping to the left, and you know I've tried to highlight uh, some areas uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, where I think I see some some amplitudes lining up, but uh, you know it is what it is, um, and we've uh, you know probably I stared at this entirely too long. Okay, so now uh, you by now are rather familiar with uh, the imaging method, uh, but this uh, presentation gives you some uh, graphics that I think will help you visualize what the method does. So, um, you know, when you talk about earthquake imaging um, to uh, seismologists or like at the SCEC meeting, everybody you know thinks first, okay, you're 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 locating uh, uh, faults, you're imaging faults by locating the hypocenters of earthquakes, and uh, in fact, you know, here in this section, in this cross section, you know, the the plate interface is down here at 20 kilometers depth. Uh, we're kind of looking northeast, so the the plate interface is dipping at uh, I think it's only uh, five degrees uh, to the to the northwest, so it's dipping down to the left slightly. Here's uh, the hypocenters in this section of uh, Weber two events, which are in yellow here, and then you can see the gray Weber one epicenters, and then here's their hypocenters uh, down here in the section. All projected into the section. So you know, here's that steep normal fault. You know, it's down to the northwest, and then uh, this thrust fault is uh, up to the uh, uh, north, to the southeast. Um, for uh, between uh, Weber one and, and Weber two, uh, really nice. Uh, you know, uh, Weber one basically shut off. And then Weber two started, so it was very easy to organize the data. Although certainly you could organize it by depth as well. The software we're using here. This is all pasted up in Illustrator. Um, you know, I, I made the I made the cross section probably in Excel, and then pasted the uh, you know the uh, the locations. I mean, this all should be done with uh, with Fleeter Mouse, right? I mean. You know, if we had more licenses for Fleeter Mouse, uh, I, I might have done it with Fleeter Mouse. But you know, we don't have enough licenses uh, to make Fleeter Mouse graphics. So yeah, I, I you know I, I you know I mean it's pretty horrible using Excel for this sort of thing, but I did. And then I I pull it out as a PDF and bring it into Illustrator, and then you know get everything uh, set right. You know. Yeah. Um, it's awful, you know. Let take my word for it. <coughs> um, you know, in Illustrator, you can uh, squash things so you can get the apparent perspective and all that. Right. Um, ought to be possible to do this in Open Detect as well. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we can certainly produce the seismic sections as uh, seg wise and bring them into Open Detect. Uh, at least I hope so. <coughs> um, Right. So then, in Illustrator, I drew in some uh, some uh, uh, illustrations. Uh, um, let's see what we've got here uh, in the in the reflectivity section. It's white where there's basically zero back projected reflectivity, and it's uh, red where the back projected amplitude is positive. And blue, where the back projected amplitude is negative. Pretty sure it's that way. Um, not that it really matters, at least to me. Um, 
So uh, uh, the section is, is a 2D section that you can get out of AARG, RG, uh, uh, Latmig, uh, SZ. Okay. Um, you've got a source here. And um, this particular station, you know, all of its, all of the Weber 2 events, so all these events, all the traces from all these events, 300 events, uh, to this station, um, went into uh, uh, making this image. Okay, so this is a single station image. There's 300 traces in that image, but uh, um, only one, uh, only one station. And you can see the station is a little bit off the section. Okay, if you if you're thinking in 3D. Um, so uh, here's an event. Uh, it's also off the section without a doubt. And um, uh, so. Uh, what we uh, what we have the uh, according to the impulse response of migration right the um, um, for for the one trace that is the uh, um, that is uh, you know this particular event into this particular station right um, the uh, the locus of all the possible reflection points uh, at a uh, particular time okay. Is uh, an ellipsoid of revolution about the line that connects those two uh, those two points, the source and the receiver. Um, and so, uh, you know, here is that ellipsoid of revolution where it hits the uh, where it hits the section. You know, so it's got this ellipsoidal shape. Uh, I doubt I've drawn it accurately. Um, so uh, this is conceptual here. <clears throat> um, so you have a you know. If this is the actual reflecting point, uh, you have a uh, uh, you have a, uh, a, a you know the wave comes out of this uh, uh, out of this um, um, uh, event, which has got a thrust mechanism, and uh, hits uh, uh, a reflecting point over here, and you can see it's uh, scattering back towards the station. At a pretty narrow theta, you know, maybe ten degrees uh, theta, um, you know, incident versus reflected uh, angle. Um, of course, there could be. Uh, uh, all right, this is, you know, this point here has the same uh, time because it's part of that ellipsoid of revolution, right? So, so you know, we have to, in the Feynman way, integrate. All of these, you know, we basically take the amplitude recorded at that station at that time, and we spread it out along the entire um, ellipsoid of revolution in 3D. Yeah. I have a question. So this method, you know, I understand how it would work for say like a dynamite survey because you're stacking up that first peak. But here, did you have to kind of like sort through all those events and make sure they had the same? Mechanism, because if they had like a reverse mechanism, you'd be sort of canceling out your. Right, right. So how do you um, how do you control that when you're doing this with earthquake data? Okay, so what you could see is when you're okay. So first, I was lucky enough that all of these events had you know, probably about the same mechanism. Okay. Um, so they and then to this station. Okay, here's the actual, you know, back projection of all those events into this one station, and as you can see, you know, they're not illuminating this at all. There's nothing over there on that side of the uh, of the ellipse. They're all in here. Okay, so um, uh, what that's telling me is that uh, you know, for the uh, the this is the vertical data. We've got much higher amplitudes coming out of, you know, in that direction, you know, in the in the down and southeast direction from those uh, that collection of events into this station. So, um, um, you know, I don't have uh, what that's giving me is, uh, uh, you know, in other, you know, other places along the line along the ellipsoid of revolution are are more nodal. You know they've got very little amplitude, so uh, 
I can claim to be to be you know I'm just adding everything together, and there is you know that cross correlation uh, with the source wavelet. Okay, so um, and, and remember that the uh, uh, in the uh, in the elastic back projection, we were you know I should be I should be like dividing by I should be making an amplitude correction by the source mechanism. But the back projection says, no, that's not the way to do it. You multiply by the amplitude of the source mechanism. Okay? So we're, you know, all the way through, we're not inverting, we're doing, we're doing what's really match filtering. We're cross-correlating. So I can say, well, I've 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 not a, I, I you would think that multiplying by the the, the source mechanism, it, uh, the re source radiation pattern. Um, I mean that's that's like squaring the amplitude effect, right? And, and I'm not doing that. You know, I didn't I didn't bother with with getting the takeoff angles and all that, and, and then I certainly did not correct for the uh, for the uh, um, for the source mechanism. I didn't invert the 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 radiation pattern because the the migration, you know, the back projection says I shouldn't. You know, in the in the back projection, you can think of it as squaring it, right? You know, it's it's you take this strong wave and you and you multiply it by the uh, uh, or or alternatively, you know, you've got a nodal arrival and it's already small, and then you multiply it by zero, right? In the in the summation, and I'm not doing that, so I can say I, I'm I'm uh, um. um I'm 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 actually overcorrecting by not squaring the source mechanism, but then you know the 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 match filtering only works as an inversion if there's really enough summation, and I think this you know this single station image is demonstrating that there is not enough summation because there should be something over here right, there really should be, um, but it's uh, you know it's just not there in the data it's too weak. You said this was a time migration, so like going back to kind of the sideways continuation. Yeah. Like I understood it in the depth migration, but for a time migration, your you know your velocity model would be in here basically as a diagonal. How did you do a time? Did you turn the time migration sideways? No, no. Uh, um, uh, the 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 time migration just has to do with the properties of the velocity model, and this is a laterally invariant velocity model. It varies only with depth. Right, but but if your source is under the ground. Mm hmm. Yes. So all I all I had to do was project I'm travel thinking, times and add them together. I guess I'm thinking like a, a gas dag or something, but that's not. Yeah, you can't do that. You got to use you got to use Kirchhoff summation. So you're saying time migration just you know gas dag assumes upgoing waves only. You know, here we got upgoing and downgoing waves and we're adding them both in. Well and they're they're kind of like sideways, I guess. Oh so yeah. It doesn't you know I'm trying to populate this entire ellipsoid of revolution. And and that's got all that's got all angles of propagation. But you know? through those calculations you're just saying, okay, you have this layered model. You know my 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 quote unquote downward continuation, which is really a you know it's a ray continuation, right, yeah. you know ray direction continuation. All it's doing is it's it's accounting for the travel time, right? I gotcha. Yeah. I like and so all I do is I uh, you know to this point I calculate I, I get the time from the source to that point, then I get the time from this point to the receiver in three D. You know, with that one D one D velocity model, so it's it's really brutally simple, okay. Yeah. And and you can see, you know, things are not focusing maybe as well as they should. There's got to be a little bit of you know three D velocity variation here that is you know could still bring these in. Well, that that kind of tearing is what got me wondering about the source. Like, if some of your sources weren't. One source is impulsive. The next one is rotational. Uh, uh, that's that's. Oh, oh, oh. Kind of scoop 
each other out like that. Yeah, so since all these sources are, are uh, very similar, hey, uh, come on in. Since all these sources are very similar, um, you know, similar mechanism, that's why we're illuminating just down here. Yeah. Right, so we got to continue next time. Thanks for your patience. That's good. That sounds like geochemistry, electron microscopy. I'm actually going to talk about, uh, um, you know, cementation of, of uh, pores. Due to uh, oh okay okay well well due to uh, due to due to depressurization due to uh, you know um, uh, drop in pressure metrology uh -huh. there you go so runs, that's runs the world geochemistry runs the world geophysics just right so we've been looking at how to um, examine these. Uh, Ellipsoids of revolution that re represent the impulse responses of uh, migration to the, uh, um, you know, a buried earthquake source, um, reflecting off a uh, a fault or some other structure, like the uh, slab interface, and then going up to a uh, earthquake monitoring station. So this black ellipse is. Um, Representing a um, uh, in in our uh, section here, it's representing the uh, you know one particular time from this trace from this uh, Weber two event above the plate interface and the uh, to this station that's uh, almost above it, and you can see that that for a lot of this ellipse, the um, you know if you trace say down to this point, you know, you'd have it uh, coming down there and bouncing straight back. It's all backscattering. Uh, the theta angles are, uh, are small, probably less than uh, 45 degrees for uh, uh, virtually this whole uh, earthquake station pair. Now let's say we pick a, a deeper event maybe from the Weber 1 sequence down below the, the slab interface, which is at 20 kilometers depth in here. And so here's a Weber 1 event. And we, we take it uh, you know, way out to this station here. Well, not that far out. Um, and so um, you know, at a particular time, close to the minimum time, close to the time of the, of the first arrival, the ellipse is pretty long and narrow. It's kind of uh, cigar-shaped or torpedo-shaped. And you can see here that the uh, the theta angle between the incident and the uh, um, and the uh, reflected wave off this point here, you know, the theta angle is uh, pretty large, pretty close to 180. All right, so you know, here's a way to get uh, uh, forward scattering. So f especially for reflectors at the slab interface, okay. We're going to be illuminating them with forward scattering uh, with the earthquakes below the Weber 1 sequence. And then, you know, very, very conveniently, a few months later, were the Weber 2 earthquakes above the slab interface where we can illuminate the, um, uh, the slab interface with backscatter. So that's how uh, I could get some control, you know, some information uh, from a good range of. Um, of theta angles, you know, I could examine both forward and back scatter. Uh, here's, uh, uh, you know, that was kind of a 3D view. Here's uh, the section in map view and a, another um, <coughs> another couple of uh, uh, candidate reflectivity ellipsoids. So maybe we have, uh, and you can see there at the foci of the ellipsoids, you know, looking down into these. Um, into these uh, ellipsoids of revolution, you know, maybe this station here sees an event uh, for Weber, Weber one that's uh, one of these gray triangles in here, and here this uh, longer, narrower ellipsoid is a, a shorter time um, uh, arrival from an event here that's uh, still, you know, pretty deep in the crust, uh, you know, maybe at uh, um, at eight to ten kilometers from Weber two, and 
seen by this uh, event, uh, this uh, station here, uh, which is the, at the other focus. So, um, you know, these since these are impulse responses, when we have artifacts, you know, due to uncorrelated uh, spikes in the data, which in earthquake data there's more than in our exploration data, those artifacts are going to follow the ellipsoidal surfaces of constant two-way travel time. And they're going to be ellipsoids in map view as well as in section view. Um, and this, uh, the minor axis of the ellipse, you know, kind of the width of the ellipse, you know, the, the later, the larger the time, the larger that minor axis. The major axis, of course, is, is absolutely set by the, um, um, it's absolutely set by the, the uh, um, location vector that connects the uh, uh, displacement vector that connects the source and the receiver. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, that I don't see him, but but I'll I'll show you. Okay, I do try to image them. So here's a you know here's an initial migration that's a P to P up at the top. It's a P to P migration. Okay, so it's uh, constructing these ellipsoids for um, you know P, the P wave velocities in the in the model. Uh, it's a, just a one D model. So it uses a directionally invariant uh, uh, travel time matrix. Um, we do have to use uh, a number of travel time matrices because we have uh, quite a few. Um, we have quite a few um, events that are that are at substantial uh, depths. So we can't assume, you know, we can't. All of our source and receiver points are not on the surface, right? If we only need one travel time matrix, if if everything's on the surface at zero z, but our sources are all over the place, they're at depths from five to uh, thirty-five kilometers in this case. So uh, I I have a you know I had uh, probably um, uh, sixty different travel time matrices. Uh, you know, for each half kilometer interval of, of source depth, and that's not uh, not too terrible a problem to uh, to have. Um, you know, the travel time matrix. Each travel time matrix is only as large as the uh, the section here that uh, you can see. Actually, it's a little bit bigger because it includes further uh, further distances, further lateral offsets. So um, we talk now about the uh, the Harlan coherency criterion. Here's the uh, the summed migration of eleven stations. You know, five hundred events. Uh, no, actually, this is just the three hundred Weber two events into uh, you know filtered down to two to eight hertz, and then um, um, <clears throat> uh, migrated. Uh, you know, as backscattering, the slab interface is in here. It should be dipping to the left uh, at about five degrees. So here's the uh, the result. Um, and as you can see, uh, I did not apply an obliquity factor for this one. I was uh, looking for structure in any direction. And the um, um, uh, let's see. So this is uh, P to P. It's uh, using the vertical data. Um, Eleven stations. Uh, um, Shot into by uh, about 300 events, and they're all Weber one. Oh, I'm sorry, Weber two events, so they're all above the slab interface. So down here in the slab interface area, we're looking mostly at backscattering. Of course, above the events in this area, we we are looking at uh, some forward scattering as well. Um, and then using uh, Harlan's trick of uh, you know destroying the trace to trace coherency of the of the data by randomly flipping uh, the signs of traces. We estimated noise, and uh, you could call it resampling if you like. And um, uh, here's the migration of the noise. Uh, in these, the red is uh, positive and the blue is uh, is negative. White is uh, no reflectivity um, or no reflections. And so then, um, uh, putting that through the uh, the Harlan um, the Harlan uh, 
uh, process, uh, identifying the the uh, proportion of the signal that is uh, a proportion of the data that is signal that is signal that's coherent in pre-stack and and coherent to what? Coherent to the migration. Okay, so you know it's following diffractions in the uh, in the common uh, receiver uh, gathers, which is how we uh, you know. Each uh, station is represented by a common receiver gather with about 300 traces. So then we can. Uh, uh, this is the the warmer colors mean higher uh, signal proportion. Uh, you can see that up at the top where the where the migration is zero, um, it gets uh, very warm. Uh, that's because the uh, you know the migration is very sure that it is zero. <laughs> so you do get uh, your peaks. Uh, um, you know, not necessarily in places where uh, you actually have data, um, but uh, it's distinguishing here. You can see that's kind of a a, um, a sensitivity pattern, right? The earthquakes are are all uh, in this area of the section, and um, the stations are you know in a, over an area a little bit broader uh, up at the top, up at the surface, and really we're we're seeing best. Kind of a cone of um, of reflectors that are that are below the uh, the earthquake swarm, the aftershock uh, distribution. And so uh, you know I don't I don't just take the uh, difference between the uh, uh, the data migration and the the noise migration. I mean I could try, but I don't think that'll work. Um, I, I I take the data migration and I screen it, I enhance it by multiplying every point of the data migration by, by the corresponding point of the uh, uh, migration coherency, is uh, what I could call this image. And um, so uh, uh, here's, uh, and, and, and you know, first I might uh, smooth that out a bit. OK, so here is the, uh, the migration enhanced by the, the coherency. And there's still, uh, you know, there's still lots of artifacts here because the coverage is so poor. Um, the uh, uh, the Lumley uh, operator anti-aliasing is applied, uh, but we're starting to see some structure. Okay, the um, you know this is 20 kilometers depth in here. We should see some westward dips. There's kind of a step in the in the structure. You know, there's the slab interfaces out here. It's out here, but it's a little bit lower. Okay, so we're starting to see some some interesting things. Have you talked about that Lumley anti-aliasing yet? Uh, no, no. So that might make uh, yeah, I've uh, that might that might make a good uh, next topic. Although I'm not uh, not prepared. Um. Is that the same anti-aliasing from the Kirchhoff migration code? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Now it's um, shakeout time. Oh. We should start hearing the the speakers on top of the business building Sorry, pretty soon. Clocks. But we're gonna do well. That clock's a little fast. It's ten seventeen. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's get back to the topic at hand. Um, but we always are. I mean, are there are there shear waves in your uh, in your um, um, in your Santa Medio data? Yeah. Right. So so um, uh, are those. Um, We've done a little bit, okay, but um, you know, to to the uh, to the migration to the P2P migration, how coherent are those shear waves? Or for that matter, how coherent is the um, how coherent is the the um um 
how, how coherent is the, um, um, the first arrival, the refraction? So, so if, you, if you're looking at, a, at, at P to P reflections, those things are, are completely incoherent. I mean, of course, they're, they're coherent in some, at some level. Okay. Um, but they are, um, uh, uh, let me ask another question. Um, how would we filter out the shear waves? You could try. Okay, have you tried it? And uh, how well does it work? Um, but aren't there shear waves that, uh, that share your frequency space with your reflections? I mean, usually there usually there are usually there's some overlap. So you you either have to eliminate part of your reflection data if you're filtering in the frequency domain, or you've got to uh, you've got to accept some shear waves in your result, right? So, I mean, how how thoroughly were you able to clean the shear waves out of your out of your sections? Right, but that takes out some of your data too. Takes out quite a bit of it. So, um, okay, you could start with a with a frequency filter, but maybe you'd have to stop. You know, maybe you only you could only without a, without affecting any of the reflection data, you'd have to stop at like fifteen hertz highest frequency for most of the surveys that I've seen. You know, say in the Great Basin. So, what would, what what else could you do? How else would you try to sh filter out shear waves? Okay, but then, okay, so the mute, um, uh, almost nobody does that anymore. Why is that? Right, and and also, if there, yeah, if there's reflections in there in the in the service wave cone, right, you're yeah. you're you're taking them out. <clears throat> now maybe that's okay, but if you're looking for aptitude versus offset, that's not okay at all. Um, well, well, let's let's work toward that. Now you said dip filtering. What does that do? How would you how would you implement that? A dip filtering of shear waves. But what's the what's the what's the think about, think for a second about the. Um, Let's let's not talk about you know shear wave reflections. Let's talk about <coughs> um, let's talk about surface waves. What do you think is the uh, lowest velocity you might see for the uh, lowest apparent velocity on the surface waves? Yeah, yeah, be a good average uh, in, in the middle of a basin here in Nevada. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the highest velocity you'd see on on the surface waves? Um, that would, to me, that would imply you would have um, service wave frequencies, you know, of um, less than one hertz. But you know, we might have used uh, ten hertz geophones to record our reflection data. So, um, you know, with ten hertz. Uh, mm, uh, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll give that to you. All right, sure, maybe fifteen hundred. Uh, that's the absolute upper upper limit of uh, <coughs> of apparent velocity. Um, now, for the reflections, what's the highest velocity, apparent velocity that you? Yeah, what's the highest apparent velocity? Uh, uh, of course. And how about the lowest apparent velocity? What about what about say from the reservoir zone? I mean, you know, not from not from the uppermost part of the alluvium, but but uh, yeah. So there's a there's a good gap, right? I mean, your idea of 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 um, dip filtering is is uh, pretty good, right? Because there's a good separation in apparent velocity uh, between um, 
between the, the fastest uh, surface waves and the, and the slowest reflections. And so, so what is that, you know, what is that, uh, yeah, well, uh, um, you know, what is the, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at a shot gather, what's the, the, um, uh, what, what is the, the, the shape? What are, what are you finding the semblance to with a p tau, uh, with a p tau transform? Yeah, and those linear features each have a velocity, right? So this all fits together. I mean, the very fast hail dip filter that we explored uh, also is sensitive mostly to uh, to linear features, okay. Um, and uh, and if you filter in the p tau domain, then you're filtering on the basis of linear features. All right. So so you know we can come up with a with a great um, a great way of uh, of filtering out the shear waves. Um, you know based on uh, based on their velocity and and their linearity. Okay. Um, but what are we doing when we migrate? We are, you know, let's say the structure is flat. We got we got one D velocity model. We got flat structure. Um, so then, when we migrate, we're essentially running a uh, uh, a linear transform on the on the data, right? And what is that finding the semblance to? Yeah, any, or any migration in the in the case, you know, let's think very simply first. You know where where the structure all the reflectors are flat and the velocity is one d. What's what are we finding the semblance to in in a shot gather? Fractions. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's hyperbolas, right? Yeah. Um, and with, if the structure is flat and the velocity one d, then it's perfectly um, you know they're 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 perfect NMO. You know, very normal move out hyperbolas, right? Now, now, okay, for our Kirchhoff migration, you know, lateral velocity variation. Um, still, what is the what is the shape that we're looking at? You know, that we're enhancing with that migration. Hyperbolic. It's a hyperboloid, yeah, yeah. But couldn't we just do like a hyperbolic radon transform and then filter in that domain? Ah, ah, ah. Well, what you, what you have just landed on is the amazing fact that the, um, that the, uh, um, um, that the migration process is a hyperbolic radon transform, which and you also know that as, t as a tomography. It's a back projection. OK. <laughs> So, right, right. So, so we are as long as our as long as our reflections are coherent, and we can see that hyperbolic shape, and as long as our shear waves are straight, and 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 they're coherent, and we can see their shape, okay, then we are, you know, we are we are we are doing like the perfect shear wave. Cutting filter by just migrating the data. So the problem, though, is when you have reflected S waves or converted P to S waves or S to P waves, right? Because they're going to still be hyperbolic. Yeah, but do they? Do they? You know, there's a certain, you know, the hyperbolas have to meet our imaging condition. Uh -huh. And so, you know, the migration I'm showing you on the screen right now, that has a P to P imaging condition. So it's still working against the the S to P conversions. It's working against the P to S conversions. It's working against the S to S reflections. Yeah. So how does it do that? Because you aren't just always going to have to live with some of those conversions, anyways. I mean, you're not going to be able. To, <coughs> well, for one thing, the the you know you look if if you're able if you have good data and you're able to look down, you know the flank of the hyperbola, right? Uh, the the 
the flank of the hyperbola for an S to S reflection is going to be much slower, yeah. right? Like half the velocity, right? Uh -huh. Of the flank of a P to P reflection. But when you're doing like semblance or you know something <coughs> with hyperbolas, your S waves are going to look like just some kind of hyperbola. So it's going to pull up in your your semblance plot as being you're not going to distinguish that from the. But P they're going to be distinguished. You know, remember, there's there's. There's two axes on the semblance plot. One uh -huh. of them is 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 NMO velocity, uh -huh. right? And the other one is is tau, the zero offset time. Okay, so the the S to S reflections are going to appear at a, you know, like half the NMO velocity uh -huh. of the of the P to P reflections. Yeah, but and then uh, and then the uh, the uh, the conversions are like halfway in between. Right. That well, we're you know with a p to, with using a p to p imaging condition, right? The p to p times, you just can't you can't follow those hyperbolas. They look incoherent. Uh -huh. They look like noise. Well, what about when you have like those those Harlan signal analysis plots, and all you're doing is just taking your semblance plot where you have good <laughs> kind of coherency, and using that to kind of filter your image. You can have those plots that have at the same point in time different velocity kind of bullseyes. So you could go then and, and be showing your, your S waves with that, right? You could be bringing out that signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the um, um, you know this Harlan plot is uh, is is it's not. This is the semblance with the exact P to P reflection in this. This is a one D velocity model, but for the exact ray set, all the source and receiver locations that uh, that this particular image is constructed from. So is that based on just having a very accurate starting model for your velocity? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, so and that's not you know that's why you know if I go back right, there is not a huge difference between the noise migration and the uh, and the um, and the data migration right. Uh huh. Uh, there, there, you know the Harlan, <coughs> you know where that difference exists. Look, it's in like you know 10, 15 percent of the whole. Of the whole uh, uh, section. That's so all we get. What I'm looking at is on that right side. There's kind of like that little cluster of coherency. And then on right, the, right here. Yeah, and on the left side there is two. So those could be two completely different types of waves that could both be. Uh, no, no. We know they're we know they're P to P reflections. Okay. But if the velocities are so different. How do you know? No, no, no. This is uh, these are all cross. These are all exactly the same cross section. The, there's no there's no velocity axis on these plots. Oh, these okay. are like these are all you, cross sections. But when you have like a, a normal Harlan uh, velocity and then tau plot, right? Right, right, right. So so what we're doing is with with the imaging condition that we're using. The imaging condition depends on the travel times, which depends uh -huh. on the velocities, right? So then we are we are following a certain path. We're taking certain parts of that plot, and we're you know. We are much more likely to land on a on an enhanced P to P reflection than we are to land on an on a, an enhanced S to S uh, reflection that's at too low a velocity. I guess what I'm getting at is when you're talking when you're using real data, aren't you always going to have to live with some degree of like of S waves or inaccuracies if you don't want to filter out too much real P to P data? Oh, absolutely. And so it's just and, like a part of the process, right? Yeah. Now, now this and this data set, um, I mean, <clears throat> you know, here's our geometry. We've got pretty good spacing, right? Where the Harlan process is showing, you know, looking down on this map view, right? We got we got a pretty good distribution of Weber two events uh, in yellow. We got a we got a, a kind of uh, arcuate, but but some distribution of Weber one events down below the the gray diamonds, right? But look at how sparse our stations are. Okay, now now that's one reason why you know for this problem, I I went with uh, I took the approach of using common receiver gathers because, you know, the common receiver gathers, uh, like this one, are, um, you know, you can see they're 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 anything but equally spaced. But there's a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of uh, um, sampling. You know, there is some sampling. And and you know th these are not entirely aliased in space, okay? Just the way I'm presenting it here. Yeah, sure they're aliased out here, right? 
you know, the slopes are too great and, and there's a complete phase shift, you know, between from one trace to another. But in here, yeah, it's not aliased. Okay, so we can expect to see some coherency. Um, but, you know, there are isolated things that are not coherent. They could be real, right? But even the, the Harlan process has a hard time distinguishing them. You know, and following the correct velocities, well, you know, in some areas we can do that, but in others we can't. Right? Everything looks like a spike. And that's, that's what the, the Harlan result is telling us here, is that not quite everything, but almost everything looks like a spike, right? Because of the similarity between the noise migration and the, and the data migration. OK, but here's the, uh, you know, so we, we smooth out the Harlan a bit, and, um, and we, uh, uh, you know, sc you know screen, the, screen the data migration through that. And here's an enhanced migration. Uh, at, coming out of the Harlan script, this would be called an X dot, EX dot uh, image. And um, it, it, has, uh, it has toned down the, uh, the artifact sum. Um, it has enhanced uh, the features that I, that I believe, anyway. This kind of flat spot that's highly reflective, and this uh, these dipping uh, these dipping spots. Okay. Um, okay. So so uh, you know that's that was the first attempt. All right. And I had several things I had to prove. You know where uh, where are these artifacts coming from? And even just looking at P2P times, there was a uh, significant uh, uh, issue that uh, that I had to prove. Uh, was not significant. It was significant in some people's minds, but uh, had to show that it was not significant. All right. If you look at um, here's our here's our uh, flat uh, flat layered velocity model, and it includes a uh, three percent low velocity zone um, in the uh, slab interface. Um, and uh, let's see. This goes down to thirty kilometers depth. So putting uh, an earthquake down here on the slab interface. You can see that uh, there's this kink, and you've seen this in your travel time, uh, um, in your travel time sections. And here, you know, you now now you know that I've uh, enhanced this travel time section by taking its uh, um, its modulus uh, with one second. Uh, and so there's the worry that this kink is is kind of unrealistic, uh, and leads to uh, kind of um, you know, saying that the uh, the data that's recorded in this kink or as a result of this kink, you know, is later than uh, than it really should be. All right. So that's what uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, that's what I tried to uh, uh, show with a with a uh, synthetic. Uh, you know, I generated a a, a synthetic uh, uh, data set. Had a I I didn't use the real uh, ray set either. Um, I just uh, use some. Uh, um, in fact, this is a two D example. So uh, there was, uh, uh, I think, just one source. So I migrated one source, but I had a lot of receivers at the top. Okay, so we had very poor source coverage and uh, uh, you know really excellent receiver coverage. Okay, so the uh, uh, you know the the backscatter from the uh, uh, from the interface below the source, you can see it's multi-cyclic. So the problem is that we're, you know, we don't have enough data to to deconvolve the source, right? So there's uh, there's too much um, um, uh, too many cycles in that in that uh, uh, energy. So if we were able to deconvolve it, it would all come back to the uh, um, it would all come back to the main reflection point on the on this lower, uh, the top of the Pacific slab, um, at the bottom of the slab interface, um, but uh, it can't uh, because uh, you know we're doing cross correlation, match filtering, uh, and you've seen where the cross correlation comes in. You know, it's just the integration over the uh, over time of the uh, source wavelet times the uh, uh, the source wavelet times the um, uh, the data, right? So that's a cross correlation of the source wavelet against the data, or actually the uh, time derivative of the source wavelet against the data. Um, 
that should uh, deconvolve if we had lots and lots of data adding up. But it doesn't, you know, you can see it's doing an incomplete job. So we got two kilometer depth uncertainty on that, um, on, on that uh, bottom of the slab interface. The overlying interfaces, uh, the focusing is really poor. Okay, there, um, and, and here there's uh, you know backscattering from below the slab interface, but the top of the slab interface and the uh, interfaces above, you know, they're only seen by um, in this in this model by forward scattering, and you can see the forward scattering is like a you know it, it it's like a, f a candle flame coming off the uh, the interface, but it gets stretched up by the uh, uh, kind of the predominant. Um, you know, obviously, there's predominant ellipsoidal uh, directions here that uh, it gets stretched along. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, but but there's uh, you know this is a full this is probably an acoustic synthetic. Uh, oh, I forgot what it was. Um, yeah, it's an acoustic synthetic full wave uh, synthetic. So there's lots of there's lots of multiple reflections in there too. Yeah. I was thinking since it's only two to eight hertz, maybe it had like big side lobes. It looks more like a cloudy laser. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, after all the multiple reflections, it does. <laughs> you know, they they okay. definitely spike the the they narrow the band. So when you have that multiple reflection wave train, can you not pick the first one? Well, you can you can see it's the first one that, that does land on it, but right. there's a little bit of, you know there's a little bit of uncertainty. What is the first one? You know. Oh, so that was your uncertainty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like which cycle do I pick? Yeah. Okay. But a lot more uncertainty, you know. But that's with, with backscattering imaging. With forward scattering imaging, it's it's a lot more uncertainty. You can kind of see it, you know. There it is, but the forward scattering is too stretched out because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's. Um, you know, its geometry is even worse. All right. Now, when you have sharp refractors, okay, uh, the low energy head waves are straight ramps, okay, in these uh, one way travel time contours. Uh, when you don't have, uh, you can you can convert these head waves to diving waves, which means that they're they're kind of looping around a little bit. In the um, you know the sharp energy interface is a ramp, you know. So I smoothed out the velocity model and uh, and recomputed the uh, um, recomputed the uh, um, um, the the travel times, and you can see that that the the sharp ramp becomes more of a curve. Okay, so that I'll, I'll call a, a diving wave. All right. And uh, the diving waves, uh, you know, if they're real, they have a whole lot more. Um, they have a whole lot more um, um, uh, a whole lot more energy. Okay, because you're not going to see. You know, that head wave has so little energy that you're just not going to see it. If if that's involved in, you know, so when you see a, when you're looking at a reflector that's uh, near a, uh, a head wave. Um, um, you know that's uh, uh, you're at risk of getting the time wrong and how much wrong. Okay, this is uh, you know for about uh, um, uh, you know the total travel time is maybe uh, uh, three to eight seconds, and where the uh, section here is red, the difference between these two travel time plots is is more than a tenth of a second. So that's the that's the risk. You know, you're going to mislocate reflectors in here, uh, and and get the wrong slope on them because the uh, the travel time is off by, uh, you know, I mean it's uh, it's off by uh, less than um, uh, less than five percent, but it's still off. Okay, and that these red areas appear, uh, you know, these errors appear um, when you're uh, when you're right above the uh, the refractor, so the um, uh, and it's only within one kilometer of the uh, of the refractor. Okay, now I, I maintain that I got a similar P2P backscatter image with either model. 
Okay, so on the left, you know, in the center here, that's uh, where I change the travel time, the velocity model, and use diving waves instead of head waves. And here's the original one that uses uh, head waves. And I think that's probably, I can't remember whether or not these are Harlan enhanced. Um, so there are some amplitude changes, uh, you know, using diving waves instead of uh, head waves. Um, but, uh, you know, also having sharp, uh, 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 sharp refractors in a crustal model is pretty realistic. So I wasn't sure that I should, you know, smooth the velocity model to that degree. Okay, now here's the, my real answer about what I did with the surface waves. So we're looking here at, at, at six components of migration. And, and the unique thing about this Weber sequence and the slab interface, you know, in, in terms of imaging the slab interface, is that I can separate you know, backscatter images from forward scatter. So I have um, uh, three different modes of, uh, of reflectivity here. And, and how do I distinguish between modes of reflectivity? It's just in the travel time. Okay. Remember, uh, uh, you're uh, you're cross-correlating, you know, against the uh, the wave that's it's, that's advanced, the data that's been advanced by the uh, or the source wavelet that's been advanced by the um, advanced by the the imaging condition, which is the source time plus the receiver time. Okay. So if I wanted to do a uh, uh, to look at S to S reflections. Then um, what do I do? I, I multiply the uh, and deepen the crust. This is probably okay. I multiply the uh, uh, the source to receiver the source to reflector time by the square root of three, one point seven three, and I also multiply. Uh, you know, I have a I have a time uh, section that gives me p times right p travel times. So I, I, if I multiply that time, that p travel time by, by the square root of three, then I have an s travel time, and I can take whichever legs I want, and convert them to s. So you know, for this s to p section, all right, what did I do? I, um, uh, I multiply the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, um, the, uh, the source time, the t sub s. By the square root of three, but then I just took the p time for the uh, the receiver time. Okay, so you know, uh, so first the backscatter. So this is computed only using only Weber two events, which are above the slab interface. Here's the image we've been looking at. This is kind of a sideways view of the of the source mechanism, and uh, and I'm giving you the location of the of the hypocenter of the main shock. Okay, so uh, that um, <clears throat> um, plane dipping to the left—that's the uh, the thrust plane dipping to the left. That's the one that uh, uh, that follows the aftershock. So that's the the true uh, plane. The aftershocks are all up in here. Um, same, you know, sideways view of the source mechanism. <clears throat> okay, same over here. Um, you know, here's the S to P. Uh, conversion, and uh, <clears throat> we're for uh, 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 what we're um, uh, what we're finding is that uh, there's not much data which contributes to the S to P. Uh, probably I cut it off too early, so I'm seeing a little bit from the upper part. You know, here's the the slab interface uh, is coming along here, comes up. And then extends out to the uh, southeast. I'm seeing a little bit of that extension, uh, maybe, in this uh, backscatter, um, backscatter S to P conversion uh, uh, mode. In the S to S, um, I can see the slab interface, and I see it strongly, uh, most strongly, um, um, in, in this area. Um, uh, at the, really, I'm seeing the top of the slab interface most strongly. Okay, what about the uh, what about the forward scattering? Okay, um, all right. Let's start at uh, at uh, S to S. You know, there's again the top of we're again. This is a sideways view. 
the, of the uh, Weber 1 source mechanism. Uh, and uh, it's the left dipping, uh, steep left dipping plane, uh, normal fault plane. That's the one that, that was real. Um, and you can see that, uh, uh, you know, in S to S, we're imaging a little bit of the uh, uh, in forward scattering, you know, probably originating from the slab interface, uh, um, you know, essentially above the event. And then, kind of flaming out along the uh, the ellipsoidal directions uh, above that. Um, an interesting, uh, you know, again, maybe this is the signal from the uh, the the slab interface. Maybe it involves these uh, these steps in the slab interface uh, here somehow. Uh, I guess that would be over here. Um, but then the real surprise was the strength of the P to P forward scattering. Okay. Very, very, uh, uh, you know, very, very high amplitude. Again, as the synthetics showed, you know, these things are flaming up along the uh, um, along the predominant ellipsoid directions. They're probably originating from the uh, within the slab interface. Again, just above uh, Weber one, and this is uh, you know with the uh, the left side going down on that Weber one normal fault. Um, you know that means that these are coming from the uh, a, a very dilatational quadrant of the Weber one event. Okay. So um, uh, you know this S to S image is trying to follow the uh, um, uh, you yeah, know we're seeing the slab interface there too. The S to S image is 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 trying to follow the the uh, the S to S imaging condition, the S to P is trying to follow the uh, uh, an S to P imaging condition, and then the P to P is following the imaging condition that we're used to. So here's my uh, uh, my backscattering, uh, um, and and I did uh, all of the um, all of the uh, uh, different modes. Um, so there's four different uh, reflectivity modes here. Um, now I am not applying. I I am not uh, I am not correcting for focal mechanism, okay. <clears throat> and neither am I, uh, which, you know, that has to be done by multiplying by the focal mechanism, not dividing by the focal by the radiation pattern, okay. Um, so I'm certainly not correcting, you know, the way that that uh, that most. Um, uh, the way that most seismologists would expect me to to correct for it, which would be to, to divide by the the radiation pattern uh, amplitude coefficient, uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not multiplying by it either. Uh, I'm not inverting the amplitudes. You know, I'm not inverting by that cosine theta or cosine squared theta, right? So um, um, uh, I'm certainly not. I'm certainly not. Uh, it, you know, trying to invert by the uh, the cosine or cosine squared theta, um, and I'm not. Uh, I'm not including that in the forward projection e in, the, in the back projection either. You know, I should be multiplying by the. You know, from Ronan Labrasse's reflection work, I should be multiplying by the the cosine or cosine squared theta, right? I'm not doing any of that. I'm just looking at the amplitude as it is. Okay, I'm not trying to. I'm I'm really separating these different modes, not on the basis of focal mechanism, not on the basis of of uh, AVO. I'm separating them just on the basis of travel time. Okay, so drawing in my my eventual um, my eventual uh, uh, model here. Okay, we've got uh, this Weber one event occurring on a kind of long term normal fault, a slab bend. Uh, normal fault, uh, but that that fault uh, uh, existed uh, probably even before, before subduction. So the fault bulldozed a big wedge of sediment uh, into the uh, uh, into the uh, uh, into the subduction interface. Um, then there's a duplex thrust of of which uh, the uh, the Weber two event is just a uh, another occurrence. Of, uh, of thrusting, and uh, you know I can I can just follow the reflections that I see, you know, avoiding some of the artifacts, 
and create those uh, those models. I mean, I, yeah, I'll have to admit I'm doing a little earthquake imaging here in the classic seismological way by drawing the fault, uh, you know, along the uh, the aftershock uh, sequence. Um, but uh, you know, we're getting reflectivity here, um, you know, in different modes on different parts of the um, uh, different parts of the uh, uh, structure. Like even this S to P image, right? We're seeing the top. I think pretty clearly the top of the uh, the this sort of offset uh, vertical offset in the uh, um, uh, in the in the uh, slab interface. This is that slab interface and its vertical offset, which makes sense. It's right above this uh, long existing uh, Weber one fault. Um, slab interface here is uh, five kilometers wide, I believe. Um, Okay, so and there's the S to S. I mean, there's still good correspondence. You know, we're seeing in some places the top and the bottom of the uh, of the uh, uh, slab interface. Um, but the but the again the interesting thing is the P to P is the strongest. Whether it's backscattering or forward scattering, the P to P is the strongest. You know, the from especially from this bright spot. Okay, it's okay. You'd see it somewhat in S to S. Yeah, but I, I'm not imaging the you know this part of the slab iter. I'm not imaging the bright spot just because of the limitations of the data. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I'm getting a bit of the uh, of the slab interface with the uh, the P to S, the top of the slab interface. Um, but this bright spot, you know. Uh, on the bulldoze side of the uh, of the uh, of the Weber one fault, the Weber one normal fault, that's uh, that's the strongest. Um, you know, this would look like uh, uh, any of the any of the big normal faults in the uh, California borderlands, or um, you know, this would look like the uh, um, the fault at the uh, on the east side of San Emilio Valley, um, actually, probably uh, it's bigger than that. It's uh, this looks like the Lake Range Fault, you know, on the east side of Pyramid Lake. Um, okay, what about the forward scattering? Okay, um, you know, again, it's ill-defined. You can see it's uh, uh, the P to P is is certainly the strongest, and it's. Uh, it seems to be coming from this bright spot at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the um, um, at the bottom of the uh, slab interface. Um, we can follow the slab interface a little bit, you know, top and bottom in the P to S. Can't really see it in the S to P. Uh, maybe we're seeing mostly kind of drawn out, um, you know. Top of oceanic crust, bottom of uh, bottom of the uh, uh, bottom of the of the Chatham Rise uh, plateau basalts, um, or the well, uh, probably here it's more properly the uh, Hikarangi uh, plateau uh, basalts, um, and uh, the S to S uh, may be indicating something about the bright spot as well, but it's not nearly as strong as the the P to P. Uh, forward scattering. Uh, interesting here, though, the P to S forward scattering is is making a conversion, you know, not a real strong one, but it's some conversion, you know, that reloc that locates right to the the bright spot. Yeah. It should be right. Because we're looking at you know we're looking at different polarities off the mechanism and I'm not adjusting for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that that's probably the focal mechanism right there. Uh, oh yeah, and you know this, and it looks that way because uh, you know, let's see, that's the dilatational direction, 
and that's the compressive direction for p, and it, and and the p to s is for p coming from the focal mechanism. Yeah. Now here I set the, uh, you know, there's a parameter called min source time, right? There we're not locating anything that's right at the sources, so I set a min source time criterion. Yeah, yeah. You can see I'm I'm getting dangerously close to near field, but uh, I wanted to keep it away if I could. Okay, so then here's the duplex thrust uh, um, um, and when I gave this uh, this lecture at Stanford, um, not the way I'm quite the way I'm giving it to you guys, but uh, they said no 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 the incipient fr thrust is not going to be back here, it's going to be at the front. So the next the next thrust is going to be you know on top of the Weber 2. So the Weber two is really the duplex uh, roof thrust, the duplex thrust, and the uh, uh, the incipient thrust would be out here in front. <clears throat> um, you know, and this is shown by the this structure is shown pretty well, I say, by the uh, by the backscattered image um, from the the Weber two events. Uh, let's see, have I missed any prominent? Yeah, the frontal ramp. That's really uh, that's really vis it's vis visible in P to B P to P and S to S backscatter, um, right? So we've got you know a mechanism for the uh, uh, pretty simple and very commonly proposed mechanism for the Weber two event. Um, all right, um, and this explains a lot just about the local topography. Um, Wellington is here. the The subduction zone is is way off uh, way offshore, okay, and uh, the direction of subduction is basically uh, uh, to the west. Uh, so here's the backbone range of the southern half of the north of the North Island, right? You expect to see that above every subduction zone, and um, uh, uh, but there's this weird uh, uh, hole in the backbone range, and there's a there's a big gorge and a river pouring through it, uh, the Manawatu River, um, and the Manawatu River um, originates in the Pukatoi Range, which is out in front of the backbone range. Okay, so uh, now we have this uh, normal. Now we know that there's this normal fault, and it. Uh, uh, I mean, it could have been a seamount, but. Because there was the weather one, the Weber one event, um, I do think it's a normal fault. So there was this pre-existing offset of the normal fault. It it uh, took a bite out of this as it was being subducted. It took a bite out of the uh, accretionary wedge, leaving this hole here uh, that's off to Cape Turn again, and um, and it and it as this uh, as this normal fault keeps getting subducted, you know this duplex thrusting is raising the Pukatoi range. And that is causing the the Manawata River to, uh, uh, you know, is able to uh, flow through, creates this hole in the in the um, in the backbone range, the Tararuas and the Ruahinis, uh, and um, enables the Manawata River to uh, break through. So the um, um, you know the whole uh, transportation layout of the Lower North Island is affected by this. Uh, Subducted uh, normal fault scar, kind of a subducted basin and range uh, range. So you think that's an antecedent river? Um, n well, the the uplift is happening, um, you know, in the Pukatoi range, and and so the uplift uh, is not happening in the. Uh, um, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is antecedent. Yeah, and it's being yeah, reinforced now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a substantial gorge. Um, very narrow, so uh, it's clearly uh, you know the the certainly the backbone ranges are going up, even right there. Um, but the uh, it's not erosion that has you know this range is thinner and lower you know the the north part of the Terra Ruiz is is thinner and lower the south part of the Ruahine is uh, thinner and lower than 
than the uh, you know the main parts of the backbone ranges. So I think I think you know this uh, this Weber one fault explains a lot about uh, about the accretionary wedge. Uh, one thing I learned uh, a couple years ago was that uh, uh, this is the only accretionary wedge in the world that is uh, about eighty percent subaerial because of the, the like the Pukatoi range and and uh, in every other in every other subduction zone in the world. Um, you know this whole portion of the uh, uh, this whole portion of the of the accretionary wedge is underwater. Now that's a, a kind of a shame because you know it's hard to image, really hard to do uh, reflection experiments across it. Uh, but that also means that geologists can go and sample it and map it, and we can see all the faulting in it. Um, so uh, uh, it's an incredible, uh, it's, an, it's, it's kind of an example of worldwide interest, an exposed subaerial uh, creationary wedge, and rising rapidly according to the GPS. OK, um, I did a 3D uh, P2P backscatter image. And um, so uh, this uh, slice of the 3D uh, image volume is along the section that we, uh, that we had. And um, you can see the bright spot. You can see the uh, the offset in the plate interface. The Weber one events are down there. The Weber two events are up here. Um, but also, I can I can take a co a constant depth section. So um, you know you can kind of see uh, where this arcuate uh, plate interface is going through. You know where you can see the <coughs> what did I call that the um, the frontal ramp. Uh, the frontal ramp is here, and on the other side of the plate interface, it's over here, um, and it's uh, you know striking uh, northeast. Um, and then here down is the level of the bright spot at uh, 23 kilometers depth. So the bright spot is uh, is restricted. This is in backscatter. Okay, the bright spot is restricted to this particular area that is right in front of the Weber One fault. If I if I draw the Weber one fault, um, you know along its aftershocks, that's where it would be at this depth, and there's where the um, uh, there's where the frontal ramp is, you know, and then the bright spot is restricted in its area. Uh, so that that you know I put together this uh, this sort of half of the uh, half of the bright spot in this area. Uh, when I constructed this uh, this sort of 3D view of it, you got an illustrator? yeah, nice. yeah, I should have done it. You know, this all needs to be put into. Um, I think it looks nice. Well, yeah, uh, that's. I mean, I was just going for a presentation figure. Um, you know, this this all um, this all needs to be uh, put into uh, GoCAD or or uh, uh, well. Uh, we got a geologic modeling program from Schlumberger, right? So, you know that. Um, I don't know what they call it, but isn't that part of the package? Uh, doesn't it include geologic and fault modeling and basin oh, modeling yeah. and all that. You're talking about Petrel. Petrel, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how well you can make a figure like this. Though. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, I need to do some real modeling of this. Then that would have told me right away that you know my idea for the incipient thrust. Down in the plate interface was bad, and you know the incipient thrust is really out here in front. Um, but here, you know, it's just a, a, a kind of lens-shaped. Uh, the Weber one fault is, you know, it's got this lens-shaped offset. It's not. Uh, it's not very long. Um, now here's the three D forward scatter image from the Weber one events, and the you know it's, I've sliced it at similar depths. Um, and you can't see the plate interface very well. This is kind of a transparent view at the top, and then slicing into it, um, you know, along our the direction of section. Then here's the slice into the bright spot, just at a slightly shallower depth. That's where the Weber one fault is. Again, you know, the bright spot's in exactly the same place for P2P forward and backscatter. Um, and then uh, I did a. Uh, a, uh, a 3D uh, um, volumetric rendering 
this is the kind of thing I need to be able to do at Open Detect now. Um, so it's just showing that <coughs> you know flame-like structure extending up towards the receivers from the bright spot along those uh, you know predominant uh, ellipsoidal directions. Um, let's see. Both forward and backscatter at the bright spot are stronger in P to P than in S to S, and this is possible if the Poisson's ratio in the bright spot is different from outside the bright spot. Okay, so we get to uh, back to the Wu and Aki uh, diagram, and I'm going to, you know, the, the at 20 kilometers depth in the slab interface. Uh, I really have to ignore delta delta rho. It's an extremely small factor. So the big factors here are delta lambda and delta delta mu. Okay. So uh, uh, we have an incident wave coming down on the on the bright spot, and in there are you know maybe we have a, a reflecting nugget of delta lambda and a reflecting nugget of delta mu. All right. The delta mu is this has got a cosine squared. Um, uh, uh, backscatter and a positive cosine squared backscatter and a negative cosine squared forward scatter. The delta lambda right scatters positively in all directions. All right. So uh, and that that kind of says why you know the forward scattering is strong. Right. It looks like the P to P. Um, you know you get a you get a these are uh, uh, elastic synthetics now. You get a P to S, uh, uh, um, a uh, delayed P to S conversion. Um, you get in backscattering. You get the uh, the the uh, there's the original P wave. There's the P to P backscatter, and so forth. That's predicted from just sending a record into it. Yeah, yeah. Very simple. Uh, very simple modeling here. Um, so. Uh, you know, again, delta lambda acting as a point explosion, delta mu acting as a point couple. Um, so a delta lambda interface, um, which is a delta, which is a change in VP without a change in VS. Okay, if you change VP but you don't change VS, right? Remember, VS depends on on the um, VS depends on on mu. Okay, only, right? VP depends on lambda and mu. I think it's lambda plus four four thirds mu, you know, divided by uh, rho. Okay, that's uh, VP. But uh, uh, VS is just uh, the square root of uh, of mu over rho. Um, so uh, if you have a delta lambda interface, which is a which means a change in p velocity without changing s velocity. Then you don't get any con s conversion, and we didn't see very much s conversion at that bright spot. It was all it was all p to p. Okay, there was no s conversion. There was very little s reflectivity at that bright spot. There was lots of p reflectivity at that bright spot. So a delta a delta v p without a delta v s that's a delta sigma, a delta Poisson's ratio. So we change Poisson's ratio. In the bright spot, the bright spot has a different Poisson's ratio than the slab interface outside the bright spot. All right. Now, what affects uh, in in this kind of material at twenty kilometers depth? What is going to affect Poisson's ratio? Of course, you know shales uh, with with bubble-like porosity they have very low Poisson's ratios. Um, you know, uh, hard rocks with. Uh, uh, Without any fractures, have a Poisson's ratio of 0.25. Uh, hard rocks with uh, that are fractured have higher Poisson's ratios. Okay. So uh, you know here's um, um, uh, <clears throat> here are uh, crack aspect ratios. Okay. So um, you know 10 to the minus four means that the uh, the crack is ten thousand times thinner than it is wide. Right. So imagine a, a kind of ellipsoidal crack. Right. And here, on the right side of the diagram, the crack is, you know, 
one tenth as wide as it is, uh, one tenth as thick as it is wide. So, you know, we're getting we're getting towards say uh, 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 a circular. I mean, a, a a vug, right? A bubble. A vug would be would be one to one, ten to the zero. All right, and um, uh, p wave uh, p wave velocity um, drops. As you um, and and this is uh, you know uh, Peter Shearer applying uh, an anisotropic theory to uh, the bulk properties of oceanic basalt. Okay, uh, let's see, and uh, I can't remember what the different lines, the different dashed lines were. Um, so. Um, um, you know, at a constant crack density, thick aligned cracks reduce VP um, uh, uh, further uh, than just having uh, you know unaligned cracks, even in the same degree. Notice that uh, you know in these different uh, for these different models, the crack Poisson's ratio does not affect the S wave velocity. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the crack ratio, the crack aspect ratio. Has no effect on the S wave velocity, but the uh, and notice that that there's minimal, you know, if the aspect ratio is uh, small, if it's a very long crack, very thin crack, there's really no effect on the P wave uh, velocity. It's when you get these more, uh, you know, bubble or vug shaped cracks, you know, the thick cracks, that's when you start taking the P wave velocity down. So the Poisson's ratio. You know, changes and goes radically lower when depending on the crack aspect ratio. Okay, so here's my here's my hypothesis. Before Weber one, we have um, uh, we have thin cracks in this uh, slab interface, including in the uh, in the wedge of bulldozed sediment. Okay, there's about three percent porosity down there, and it's all thin uh, shear cracks. Maybe the porosity is is five percent in the bulldozed wedge of sediment in the normal faulted basin in front of the Weber one fault. Okay, the uh, uh, the slab interface material has a uh, Poisson's ratio that's because of the the thin cracks, it's got a Poisson's ratio above 0.25. All right, and the interface should Thus, strongly convert S to P. All right, um, that's yet unproven in the Weber area. The S to P conversions have been seen uh, to the north in that in the same slab interface. Okay. Okay. During Weber one, right, um, at the bright spot, we have uh, we're in the the decompressive uh, we're in the extensional or the uh, 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 this basin is falling into the into the earthquake uh, into the into the focal sphere. Okay, this this cone here is in the um, the decompressing quadrant of the of the focal of the uh, focal mechanism, the Weber one focal mechanism. Okay, so suddenly uh, the normal rupture has decompressed sediments in the hanging wall. Okay, that makes sense. The brines that fill the cracks precipitate minerals into the thin crack ends, and suddenly we have changed the aspect ratio of the cracks. Okay, the decompressed cracks suddenly have a much larger aspect ratio. You know, they've gone from ten to the minus four to ten to the minus two, maybe. All right. So after Weber one, you know, we got the same total porosity. Right, we we haven't gotten rid of the fluid, but it's in now in cracks that are that are have a much larger aspect ratio. Okay, so the decompressed sediments in the hanging wall and the and the bright spot that's there, they have now reduced Poisson's ratio and reduced VP. Okay, the VP and uh, uh, and delta lambda contrast of the bright spot against the surrounding rocks. Which don't you know? That's not a bull. The above and below, it's you know basically all basalt. 
So uh, it doesn't have the bulldozed sediments, right? So there's less porosity. And so in the, in the you know, they have a normal 0 0.25 Poisson's ratio, OK? And then we have this reduced Poisson's ratio, maybe 0.2 even, as low as 0.2, in the slab interface, you know, depending on how, how spherical the cracks got, OK, the porosity got to be. Um, so the VS, um, the, the, the contrast of the, of the shear velocity and delta mu against the surrounding rocks of the slab interface remains normal. So there's no there's no added uh, shear reflectivity. Yeah. John, if you compress the sediments, why would you not have lower porosity? Well, we're 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 decompressing the sediments, okay. But, but there's there's no way. Okay, so right after Weber one, yeah. within days of Weber one, you know, there's no way that that the uh, the fluids could in that short time escape the. Uh, uh, um, you know, the earthquake was not the earthquake was not in the slab interface. It was below the slab interface. Uh -huh. So there's nowhere there's nowhere for those fluids to go. You can't change the total porosity. That's that's my hypothesis. Okay. Okay. At least not not in a few months, right? No way to no way to get have those fluids move around much in five months. Okay. Okay. And that's the that's my 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 monitoring interval. Okay. So uh, you know, porosity and VS have not changed. Only VP. All right. So we see, you know, outside uh, outside the bright spot, we've got strong S reflectivity and kind of you know weak uh, uh, lambda reflectivity, uh, weak P reflect, weaker kind of normal P reflectivity within the bright spot with these vug like uh, porosity. Okay. We have the normal, you know, and small s reflectivity, but the the uh, the mu reflectivity is normal, but the lambda reflectivity has suddenly shot through the roof. Okay, big uh, big lambda reflection coefficient from a big uh, shear from a big p velocity change. Okay, but not an s velocity change, right? The the crack aspect ratio matters not to the to the s velocity. Okay, so the uh, the Weber one and Weber two aftershock energy gets strongly P to P scattered, both forward and uh, um, and uh, back scattered, right? And and notice that the scattering is just as strong, you know, for this delta lambda reflectivity that's big. The forward scattering is just as big as the back scattering, or, and vice versa. Okay. Uh, you know, an S is scattered to a smaller degree. That's that's a very usual degree of scattering. Okay. All right. So the the you know we can see the and you can see it right in here. The reflection survey with earthquake sources has shown subduction interface geometry. We've got a fault bend Weber Weber two thrust in the upper plate. We've got a fault. A Weber one slab bend fault uh, that's offsetting uh, about two kilometers of bulldozed sediment and fluids down dip in the slab interface. The uh, so that we got this trap sediment and fluids. The strong P to P but weak S to P and S to S scattering suggests that we have um, um, higher um, higher phi without lowered without um, Lowered mu, no, it's uh, it's um, it's higher uh, lambda without lowered mu. Okay, um, so uh, 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 let's see. Well, anyway, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a higher delta delta lambda without uh, lowering the uh, the mu. Okay. So uh, that's an application of um, of this uh, um, uh, that involves a lot of the aspects of the of Ronan Labrasse's uh, elastic uh, um, back projection. That's uh, just a Kirchhoff migration.